Father, send me. This is the prayer that the Church of the Nazarene has prayed from the very beginning as she sent her people into the world, a world that desperately needs Christ's transformational love. Today, we are part of a global movement in which God is actively redeeming His creation, restoring the broken through His beautiful gift of salvation offered to all. We have been called to partner with Him in this movement. This is why Nazarene Missions exists, to share His love, compassion, and peace as we start new Nazarene churches around the world. Entire communities are being transformed through the partnerships and relationships developed by our local churches. Nazarene missionaries are partnering with local ministers and lay leaders to bring restoration, share the gospel, and build sustainability within these communities. As each church body is developed, Nazarene Missions provides ongoing resources that help the church be effective in ministry and outreach. Our partnership ensures that the local church has a collective and immediate impact, an impact that will last for generations to come. You and I are vital to this movement, a movement that is answering the call to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. This is only made possible through your prayer, your partnership, and your generous sacrificial giving. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God. Welcome to November's Mission Lesson. Today we're going to look at times when starting over or starting new in missions was necessary. And the title is, When Starting Over Is Not Failure. As Isaiah 61.4 says, They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And Psalm 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. We're going to look at a couple of different countries just briefly tonight talking about how starting over isn't failure in a lot of cases. Cuba uh, is one of the countries, and it's a tradition in Cuba to burn doll dolls at New Year's Eve to symbolize the forgetting of bad times and look forward to a fresh start with the new year. Cuba also has one of the highest literacy rates in the world, with 99.8% of the population being literate. That's really, really high. Cuba is the largest Caribbean island, both in size and population, and as of 2018, there was 11.1 .1 million people in Cuba. Cuba also is the only country in the world that has a dual currency system. How it started was that tourists, they thought, would use what they call the Cuban convertible pesos, and they wanted the Cubans themselves to use the Cuban national pesos. But apparently it didn't take because now both tourists and Cubans use both currencies interchangeably. Cuba also has the highest doctor-to-patient ratio in the world. As a result, many Cuban doctors go to countries where medical aid is required because there's so many doctors in their own country. As far as the Church of the Nazarene statistics in Cuba, as of 2018, there's two districts, 113 churches, and over 8,900 members. We entered the work in the Church of the Nazarene in Cuba back in 1902, so it's a, it's a fairly old uh, area. Another country is Lebanon. The country underwent civil war between 1975 and 1990 due to fighting between two religious groups. Lebanon's parliament is equally divided among religious groups. It has 18 recognized sects and 128 seats. So their president must be what they call a Maronite Christian. I looked up Maronite and it's related, uh, loosely related to the Catholic Church, but they do have their own traditions. The prime minister is a Sunni Muslim and the speaker of parliament is a Shiite Muslim. So they divide it up amongst the religions. In Lebanon, a piece of land can have two legal owners. The piece of land could be owned by one, and the crop growing on the land can be owned by another. So in order to buy a piece of land, you have to pay both parties if you want to actually own both the land and the crop, and you want to become the sole owner of the land. The Church of the Nazarene in Lebanon 
it was entered, we entered that country in 1950, so it's a newer uh, area, of, uh, newer than Cuba. There's one district, four churches, and 271 members. There is a Nazarene evangelical school in Lebanon that was founded in 1966, which has classes for students ages 3 through 15. And then the third country that we touch on is uh, India, which is the location of the South Asia, Nazar Asia Nazarene Bible College in Bangalore, India. And they have a total enrollment of over 2,500 students and over 526 degrees have been granted. Now, as I mentioned, it's start talking about starting over. Starting over is always a challenging endeavor. Some people connect it with failure. Some might consider it disrespect love disrespectful of those who pioneered whatever it is up for reassessment. Then there's also the unknowns of whether it's worth even starting over, uh, you know, or is it going to be wasted time and energy. We're going to look at times when starting again was necessary for some ministry or mission endeavor. Start with Cuba. Cuba is on the finger of land that looks like a broken bridge between Haiti and the eastern point of Mexico, and it sits in the Caribbean Sea. Missionary work in Cuba has had a lot of stop and goes. The first holiness missionaries came in 1902, but didn't connect with the Church of the Nazarene until their sending church, which was the Pentecostal Mission Church, joined the Church of the Nazarene in 1914. In 1920, the Church of the Nazarene actually had to close the work in Cuba, but one of the original missionaries, Miss Lillian Gardner, she made the personal choice to stay in Cuba with the Cuban people. It wasn't until 25 years later, 1945, the work was reopened with Reverend and Mrs. Lyle Prescott, who would concentrate their efforts in Havana, which is on the north coast of Cuba. By the end of the next year, there were six new pastoral candidates. In 1947, a tuberculosis patient, Arroyo Hondo, was recovering in a sanatorium in Havana, and he re received visits from some Nazarenes and eventually became a Christian because of that. He went home and led his family and neighbors to Christ and became the pastor to a small but growing group. In 1950, a 10-acre property went up for sale and they realized it would be the perfect campus for a Bible school and district center. The Cuban Nazarenes enjoyed their first of many camp meetings there and the school opened with five students. In the next seven years, three other missionary couples arrived and by 1957, there were 15 organized churches and 20 preaching points, with a total membership of 226 and 18 students in the Bible school. Then, unfortunately, there was another significant regime change which occurred, and it forced the missionaries again to leave Cuba. The Nazarene leadership, they were able to send representatives from time to time, but they couldn't send missionaries during this time. Dr. H.T. Reza, who held citizenship in Mexico, he was one of the few who would, was able to visit and brought back encouraging news. And he predicted that one of these days things will change in Cuba and the gospel will flow, flow freely again like the waters of a strong river. At first, when things did start to change, it wasn't a strong river, it was more like a little stream. There were four independent missionaries, one of whom had Nazarene ties, and they started a church in Barcoa. When they had to leave Cuba in 1959 because of the political tension, the church was left to Nazarenes. For the next 27 years, the government barred services in the church, but that didn't stop the people. They met in homes or buildings, sometimes even walking 10 miles to get to church. In 1980, Nazarene pastor Emilio Palermo decided to reopen the church in Barcoa. When political repression tried to eradicate it still didn't stop them. They started growing again. And by 1940, or 19, 2014, the Cuban district had grown from 35 churches with 3,400 members to 88 churches with over 8,700 members and 23 church-type missions and 570 preaching points. It had come time to divide them into two districts, the East and West districts. Two years later, in 2016, Cuba celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Nazarene Seminary. Nothing shouted the sustainability of the battered country more because what God plants, God grows, even when people must start over. Lebanon had uh, Reverend Moses Hago Hagopian, who was the first Nazarene voice in Lebanon. He was assigned to Palestine, but he held services in neighboring Lebanon. 
understanding how uh, fragile the government was, Syrian and Lebanese evangelicals united in 1945 as the evangelical community in Syria and Lebanon, and each country supplied a Nazarene representative who served on the board. While Nazarenes had been in Syria since 1920, there was no official Nazarene work in Lebanon. In 1948, the Palestinian War of Partition pushed Arab and Armenian Nazarenes out of Jerusalem and into Beirut, which spawned a church of 35. A Nazarene pastor in Jerusalem helped them purchase a five-story building where Arabic and Armenian services were conducted. They even started an elementary and secondary school growing enrollment quickly to 300. In 1954, we finally had Reverend and Mrs. Donald E. Reed, who became the first official Nazarene missionaries to Lebanon, followed by the Carkers in 1966, uh, the Lathrops in 1967, and the Johnstons and uh, Buses in 1969. Then everything fell apart again when civil conflict forced missionaries to leave in 1975. The Civil War severely damaged the building that they had purchased at Ashrafia. The unrest required that missionaries leave Lebanon to move to next door Jordan. What happened next was more of a transitional process which required new ways of overseeing the work in Lebanon. So national leaders stepped up. Reverend Lathrop traveled multiple times to Lebanon from Jordan to give the support he could. Field strategy coordinator Lindell Browning directed and encouraged as he could. Later in 2000, the Church of the Nazarene sent Reverend and Mrs. Bob Brunson. Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Coordinator for the Middle East, Rod Green, also made Lebanon his center of operation for a while. In 1985, Middle East missionaries recognized that they needed a new Bible training model for their pastors. No one had graduated from the course of study for ministers or been ordained for 20 years. Because of the civil war in Lebanon and ongoing political tension in other parts of the Middle East, it made it necessary to close the Bible College in Beirut for 16 years, so something had to change. After much thought and prayer, they decided to use Cyprus as a teaching center because it was the only neutral territory in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And they offered intense classes for four to six weeks each summer, and it worked. Attendance grew, newly ordained pastors were ready to take their places in different parts of the Middle East. Today in Lebanon, they have accepted their strategic place in accepting refugees from war-torn Syria. While there are only four churches in Lebanon, each has found a way to minister to the people around them. One of the churches has a school in Beirut that we mentioned earlier, so it's been an excellent place to help educate many of the refugee children and work with their families. One Lebanon church works to provide health care for refugees. Others participate in ministries that offer food. The Nazarenes in Lebanon probably don't see their work as something that started over. They see it more as God redirecting their vision to the needs around them. In 2018, Lebanon reported four churches with 241 members and average weekly worship attendance of 870. And so the church is growing, even though they've had to start over and over. In the United Kingdom, Pastor John encountered a church struggling to sustain Sunday school for children at the expense of classes for the adults and youth. When they started to grow, they saw that there was a lack of nurturing Sunday school experience for new believers of all ages. So Pastor John called a board meeting and suggested closing Sunday school for six months in order to provide extensive training. Training included different learning styles and learning about different approaches, and they decided to schedule Sunday school after morning worship. We saw that happen in our own church, too. The pastor decided to facilitate a class for adults after worship, too, and they would use the sermon as the lesson. Everyone was excited about the new start. And another part of it, the design was to bring everyone together for the last 20 minutes so children could share what they learned, the youth could present a skit about their lessons. The new model thrived and it quadrupled attendance during the first month. But it really wasn't about the numbers, it was about the learning. In Pastor John's own words, he learned that it's okay to stop something that's no longer working and to start fresh with hearts and minds focused on the purposes of God. Lastly, we talk about India and the Bible college there. There was, at the turn of the century, they couldn't ignore the fact that the Bible college in India was failing. It was time to rethink what would serve the growing work in India and South Asia best. So first, they decided to close the Nazarene Bible College in India. At that time, there was only three faculty and staff serving 11 students in one language. 
No one really wanted the closure, but they needed to do something different. So it became a longer transition, unfortunately, than anyone wanted. But six years later, they were ready to open South Asian Nazarene Bible College in Bangalore, India. Faculty developed a robust educational system in the region, and the first graduation sent 66 graduates from the course of study into ministry. Today, there are 120 faculty who teach a standardized course of study to over 2,500 students in 15 languages in five countries. Earlier concerns about a closure gave way to celebration. So starting over can open doors to a whole new world of opportunities. So these are just a few examples on the mission field where they actually had to start over or keep restarting over and over again. And yet, as uh, Pastor John mentioned, as long as they're focused on the purposes of God, it ended up being very successful. So we don't want to see starting new or doing something different as being a failure. So that's it for this month. I look forward to Thanksgiving, pumpkin pie and turkey. And again, remember, we do have missionary books. If you need one, talk to the pastor or myself and we'll get those to you somehow. Thank you and have a very great Thanksgiving. Nazarene Missions is a movement of God through the people of God.